Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about blue animals, or actually, a lack of blue animals. We're going to try to answer a question why blue animals are so extremely rare, and why in reality, none of them are actually truly blue. They all use various tricks of light. And also discuss one of the recent papers that studies one of the blue birds somewhere out there, discovering the tricks some of these birds use in order to produce blue plumage and blue feathers. So in other words, why is it that blue is so rare in nature? Well, I guess let's start with the idea of colors. Today we believe that millions of years ago, specifically about 700 million years ago, most animals were probably more or less colorless, with some probably being green in color mostly because of chlorophyll. But then, approximately 600 million years ago, something incredible led to the evolution of eyes, and suddenly colors mattered a lot. They mattered in various courtships, they mattered in a lot of different survival strategies, and they also mattered for a lot of different reasons and created a completely new way for different species to sort of communicate. And today we have a tremendous explosion of various colors across different species. For example, look at this parrot, it's filled with colors. But here's the thing though, a lot of the colors that this parrot has are true pigments, except for blue. It doesn't actually have a blue pigment, even though it sort of appears to have blue. And same thing with this pigeon right here. Even though it appears to have blue, it does not have blue pigment in it. Different birds, same story. No blue whatsoever. And even this almost entirely blue bird right here is not actually blue. Okay, it looks blue, but it does not have blue pigment anywhere. And that's because of one major reason. Blue is extremely rare in nature and especially rare in different animals. As a matter of fact, blue pigment does not actually exist in animals, with one tiny exception I'm going to mention a little bit later. So pretty much all animals out there use various strategy to try to create blue. And because of this rarity of blue, this is probably why humans have been obsessing with blue for an extremely long time. As a matter of fact, blue is always selected as the favorite color in every single country in the world. And blue was always seen as a kind of a royal or some sort of a really expensive color to have and was always extremely expensive, with certain countries going to the extremes to try to protect various types of industries that were able to produce blue pigments. Now normally these pigments were produced either from a plant known as woad or from various inorganic minerals such as lapis lazuli or azurite. But for various animals, like these frogs right here, they had to find a way to create blue in some other way. And even these blue flowers right here do not actually have blue pigment on the inside. They normally contain what's known as anthocyanin, which is a type of a red pigment that tends to change colors depending on the acidity where it's present. And so sometimes if you place these flowers into some sort of acidic compound, they'll actually turn into a different color, for example purple. But because many animals rely on colors for a lot of different reasons, such as for example scaring away predators, most animals found a way to absorb colors by eating various plants. I think the best example in this case are the pink flamingos. The pinkness comes from various carotenoids, which are pigments, that they get from eating the food. And the things back in the days when flamingos were captured and kept in the zoos, the zookeepers were really confused why flamingos, the babies of flamingos, did not actually turn pink. They, eventually they realized that it was actually because of the food. With one of the coolest examples being this right here. These are known as sacoglossa, and they're essentially solar-powered sea slugs. These sea animals are able to absorb a lot of different chlorophyll from algae that they eat, and then even reuse this chlorophyll to produce their own energy. And even we humans have pigments. We have melanin, which gives our skin color and also protects us from dangerous solar radiation. Also interestingly, for birds, melanin also tends to keep their feathers really strong. So all species use pigments for different reasons. But because there is no blue pigment present in any of the plants, it cannot be absorbed. And so these blue butterflies or these blue frogs did not actually turn blue by eating something. None of these animals are able to produce a true blue pigment. And in every single case, all of these animals use somewhat different, really tricky strategies to try to appear blue. For example, for these beautiful butterflies right here, the blue here is produced through various reflective scales made from this wonderful material known as chitin. And chitin is present in a lot of different species on the planet to usually construct skeleton and to make things really hard. 
But if it's made into tiny scales and if it's arranged in different ways, it can sort of start reflecting blue light, thus creating the blue effect on various butterflies. Blue snakes also use a very similar strategy, but in this case it's the actual shapes formed between the scales that end up producing the blue light that we see afterwards. But what's really mind-blowing is that a lot of green snakes and also a lot of green frogs are not actually green at all. Many of them have yellow pigment inside their skin, but their scales still form this blue pigment from the structural changes between the scales. And when you combine yellow and blue, you get green. Which means that once these snakes perish, they all turn blue because the pigment starts to disappear. And so pretty much all of these animals have blue simply because of the so-called structural changes, including, of course, the famous peacock. In science, this is known as the structural coloration. And the peacock feathers in this case represent the best example. And so by creating these various layers of miniature structures inside, for example, a scale or a feather, these structures end up creating what's known as interference. The incoming light, depending on the wavelength, gets refracted slightly differently, and then the reflected light in this case either gets completely cancelled out, or it ends up being even more intense if the wavelengths align with one another. And so if we were to, for example, look at this beautiful butterfly and start zooming in on some of the structures produced by its wings, we discover these extremely complex layers of microstructures that essentially create this interference that then produces all of the colors we're observing. And that's how it's essentially done with every single animal that's blue. But the actual process itself, the process of interference, can be different depending on the animal. For example, certain birds like blue jays will actually form unusual bubble-like structures that end up scattering and sort of canceling out everything except for blue light. There's a link in the description below that kind of goes through a lot of this in more detail and talks a lot about how other birds produce colors as well. All of this is based on the Cornell Lab Bird Academy. And so, in a nutshell, a lot of these colors are produced by these nanoscale structures, and a lot of these structures function as a kind of a filter that hypothetically could definitely be used in different industries, which is why a lot of scientists today are super interested in trying to understand this a little bit more. More importantly, they want to understand how these different animals create these structures and create these colors. The actual process seems to be extremely complex. One of the good examples here is from the strange mollusk known as the blue rayed limpet. It seems to create a lot of different layers of calcium carbonate crystals that are exactly 100 nanometers in thickness. And by having these layers, it then is able to cancel out everything except for blue light. And so this sort of precision of being able to manufacture these types of crystals is sort of useful for a lot of different industries. But then when it comes to this recent study, and they were actually studying birds once again, they discovered that some birds, specifically the species they refer to as the blue-winged leaf birds, seem to create extremely precise versions of these bubbles on the inside, which gives them this really beautiful shimmery blue color on their shoulder, and that's never been seen in any of the other birds before, so their way of generating blue is even more extreme and even more precise. The actual structure in this case is extremely interesting because this is what's usually referred to as a gyroid. It's basically an inverse sphere. And so this bird is somehow able to form these gyroid structures, or gyroid crystals to be more exact. And because all of this is naturally produced and somehow is self-assembled, this potentially has a lot of applications in various photonic industries. Obviously, if the scientists are able to figure out how all of this works. One example provided in the study is to use this to somehow transmit blue light more efficiently in, for example, fiber optic cable. By using similar structures on the inside, it would be possible to completely eliminate all other colors and have extremely strong signals. So this is just one of many potential applications. But overall though, it's just a really interesting concept. The concept of blue as a color in animal life. Every single animal that possesses any kind of blue found very different strategies to try to create it using various structural changes. Except for this animal, this butterfly right here. As I mentioned previously, there's one exception, and this is it. It's the only animal we know of that's able to naturally produce blue pigment. This is known as the Abrina olivin or Nesea abrinus. And for some unknown reason, they figured out how to make blue pigment completely by themselves, without absorbing it from anything. And so this idea of blue color in animals is extremely fascinating. The reasons behind it, the way that it's created, 
and the various strategies animals use to try to maintain certain colors. Especially because of the strategies that some of the birds use and how this could be one day applied to various technologies for various human use. And just the fact that something like this is created completely naturally and then ends up producing these various colors is sort of mind-blowing. Nature is really mind-blowing. But nature also created us and we're able to sort of reflect on this and to then somehow use this to make things slightly better for us and for a lot of other things on the planet. But in a nutshell, that's pretty much all I wanted to mention in regards to the blue color of animal life and the mysteries of blue in nature. Check out all of the relevant links in the description below, subscribe if you still haven't, and share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences. Either way, come back tomorrow to learn something else, maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining the channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. And stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.